In the previous video, we discussed this representation for job titles. And the pipeline we had was a little bit like this. We had these names of professions, which we decided to model as text. Inside of scikit-learn, we can use things like the count vectorizer to turn all of that into a, a sparse representation. This was all well and good, but not every machine learning model can deal with sparse matrices. There are lots of columns in this matrix as well, so it's not going to be that convenient to just turn us into a dense array just like that, because that might not fit in memory. So instead what we did is we used principal component analysis. This can handle sparse features these days. This gave us a dense representation with way less columns. And the benefit of this is that you can pass this down to downstream tasks that rely on dense matrices instead of sparse ones. We also inspected the latent features that were generated by this embedding. And as you might expect, the first few features are the most pronounced. It does gray out after a bit over here. But the purpose of this video is to maybe rethink this embedded space from the get-go. After all, you could wonder if this is the most sensible representation that we can come up with for downstream tasks. Depending on the task that you're dealing with, it might also be nice if these latent features were somewhat interpretable. And right now, it's not like I'm able to say, well, oh, feature 10, that has this meaning. And there's also this other aspect that this latent feature representation doesn't show as is, and that's the fact that we are actually dealing with clusters in our input data. Over here, we have the word specialist in the job title, and we also have that over here. That can be seen as an argument for similarity, but hopefully you can also imagine that given lots of these words that might overlap, and also because these texts tend to tell you something about the field that someone is working in, it also feels like it would be nice if we could have some sort of a representation technique that can also do a little bit of clustering while it's making these embeddings. Inside of the scrub library, there is a component called the gap encoder that does exactly this. The goal of this video is to briefly talk about how it works and also to show you what nice features could come out of it. So let's talk about the gap encoder. The gap encoder does a few things, but one thing that's part of the gap encoder is that step that takes our text, passes that through a count vectorizer, and that gives us our sparse array. This is definitely part of what is happening under the hood. However, from here, it starts doing something a bit more mathy as well. Suppose that X over here is that sparse matrix. Then what the gap encoder does is it tries to do a matrix factorization. Effectively, that just means that we have a matrix that we're just going to approximate with a matrix multiplication instead. And again, to emphasize, we've got our uh, sparse matrix over here. And we're saying that this is going to approximate the multiplication of two other uh, matrices. Now, because we've got a matrix over here that could be of size n times m, then we also need to make sure that the matrices that we're going to use as an approximation allow for that. But it is also good to point out that we have a little bit of wiggle room in the middle over here. We can kind of pick the number of components in the middle as long as the shape over here matches. Uh, we do have some wiggle room. We could try to approximate this, by the way, with two dense matrices. The key here is that this is an approximation. We're not going to be able to match it perfectly. But given that we are attempting a matrix factorization, we can now think about some techniques that might give us matrices with properties that we are interested in. In particular, what the gap encoder does is it tries to make this matrix over here a bit sparse. By applying techniques that make that matrix sparse, we also gain some interpretability. Imagine, if you will, a column from this matrix. Then that column will not have a value a lot of the time, but sometime it will activate. And that's interesting, because that might imply that this column should only trigger if there are similar candidates or if there are clusters. And that allows us, in hindsight, to figure out what those clusters might mean. Now, the way that the gap encoder goes about enforcing this sparsity is also related to the name. There is an update rule in this system, 
And that update rule uses some probability distributions, the gamma distribution, as well as the Poisson one. That's where the name comes from, by the way. And to phrase it mathematically, we are assuming a specific distribution that enforces sparsity because we've picked a prior the right way. And there's lots of mathematical details that would apply here. But maybe a simpler way to think about it is that we just make some assumptions about the way that this matrix should learn from the data. The update rule has been adapted such that what comes out is bound to be sparse in some way or form. There's a bunch of mathematical details here that are actually pretty interesting, and you can find all those details in the original paper, which I will link in the show notes. And because this video needs to be somewhat short, I'm not going to go into too many details there. But there is this one detail about the implementation that I do think is nice to highlight because it is somewhat unique. So we're going to do this matrix factorization, but let's think about what that might be like from the scikit-learn estimator's perspective. This gap encoder will have a dot fit method that allows us to learn from the data. And at that point in time, we are definitely going to try and do a matrix factorization. X goes in, and we are going to figure out a good matrix A and a good matrix B that would approximate X. Now, the thing that's actually super interesting is that once this is done, we are going to be keeping this matrix B around, and this matrix A during the fit step can be seen as something intermediate that is then forgotten. Later, however, we are also going to transform our data. And again, we are going to be doing this factorization. But because we ran fit, that also means that this matrix B is available to us at this point. And we're going to keep that frozen when we do our transform. Again, X is given at this point in time then, and so is B. And that means that this A over here, this matrix, that is going to be the output of the estimator. That also means that during a transform step, we are definitely still going to spend some compute because we are doing this matrix factorization. But the matrix that comes out is, again, something that is sparse because of the way that we're optimizing this. It is also something that therefore has some interpretability. And I would also like to highlight that there's actually a hyperparameter in all this as well, which is the size of these two matrices or the number of components that we're able to specify here. When you see all of this, you might also be reminded of somewhat old school topic models. Some of the ideas that I'm presenting here are not unlike what those topic models used to do. And in particular, Notice how these two matrices A and B kind of have an interpretation of their own. One shows how each row has different topics in it, and the other one relates the topics back to the original words. But the main thing at this point that I hope you appreciate is that this gap encoder does a couple of these extra steps in between that enforce sparsity and therefore might also give us some interpretability. And the easiest way to maybe demonstrate that is to actually show you. In a moment, I'm going to show you what this chart might look like when we use the gap encoder instead. But before I do that, I just want to observe a few things. Because I'm dealing with PCA and some count vectors over here, these latent features don't really have interpretability. What I can see is that some vectors might be similar, but it's not like I can really take one of these features and associate a meaning to it. It's not like there's a category here and I can look up what words really fit this one column very well. But let's now compare this to the gap encoder output. That would look a little bit more like this. I've had to zoom out to make sure that everything fits on screen, but you can see that definitely the output is pretty sparse. A lot of the values in this matrix are zero, but some of them actually do light up. For example, I've got mechanic technician, another technician, technology, technician. These professions over here, they seem to light up smack dab in the middle right there. There are also some professions over here where two columns trigger at the same time, but a lot of the time only one column would trigger uh, for a single profession. Now what's cool about this is that in hindsight you can actually look, hey, this one column over here, what words were most associated when that column got triggered. And that actually allows us to figure out some words to describe a column. So if I have a look at these information technology specialists over here, the one over here, if I were to scroll down, 
then yeah, it seems to be about a topic that's all about technology, technicians, or being a mechanic. And we should remember that this is not going to be perfect. In a lot of ways, we're doing clustering here, not hardcore NLP. We're also not doing anything with embeddings. But when you're dealing with dirty categories, being able to do representation learning while also being able to do sort of topic modeling on the same estimator, that is definitely unique. But it is also something that's just kind of pragmatic. The reason why the gap encoder works is because we are forcing sparsity. And if you think about the matrix factorization, you can also see how that can act as a forcing function. Once again, if we have our matrix X over here, that's our sparse matrix that needs to be approximated very well. If we force that this matrix over here, that is sparse, that only very few columns can trigger, then you can definitely imagine that the only way to get there is to use whatever clusters are available here. Especially when you set K to be a relatively small number, clusters are the main way to ensure that we still have some good approximation going on here. I hope you find this observation interesting, but I can also imagine that you might have a question lingering in your mind at this point. It's definitely cool that we are able to have something of a interpretability win over here, but at the same time, you might also wonder, is this also going to be great for accuracy? It's great to be more interpretable, but will the gap encoder always give us the best performing model as well? That is something that requires a benchmark, which I would like to highlight in the next video.